Thank you, everybody, and thank you for that nice introduction. So as I said, if you uh, fall asleep on my presentation, there is an article in the new J JOSBT journal on return to uh, sport after Achilles tendinopathy, so you can pick it up and read it when you leave. I also uh, followed Mario, you know, you have to keep time. You're in Switzerland, so I downloaded an app to keep my time. I didn't start it yet, though. <laughs> so um, it's really I'm going to talk to you about return to play kind of in the general sense of tendinopathy and then more specifically of Achilles tendinopathy. I do think that you can use the program that we're talking about Achilles tendinopathy to kind of modify any kind of tendinopathy patient that you have. So we were asked to talk about how this talk will affect your knowledge and practice. And I would say for me, the goals of this talk is to challenge the concept of using pain and symptoms as the sole outcome for determining the ability to return to play. And I think you kind of heard that earlier today too. Promote treating minor symptoms of tendinopathy early with load control instead of ignoring or just treating the symptoms. And Ben, ben just said that ahead of time too. So they really built this up. I also want you to consider that changes in sports performance might be a possible sign of tendon overuse without having any symptoms whatsoever. And I also want to describe a return to plague program for Achilles tendinopathy that then can also be used as a guideline for other tendinopathies. So when we talk about return to play after tendinopathy, what is the goal of treatment? I mean, is it having no symptoms or is it to be able to return to the previous performance level, not just the pre previous sports? And in one of our studies that were published in British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2007, we actually looked at, it's a fairly small sample, but we looked at all the patients that we had treated that then had no longer had symptoms. And we evaluated them with a test battery that we had previously designed uh, for Achilles tendinopathy. And what we found was that full symptomatic recovery did not ensure full recovery of muscle tendon function in these patients. So function is obviously not recovered or directly related to the symptoms. Of interest is we used the comparison, like we all do, the limb symmetry index. We compared the injured side to the healthy side. What you got to realize, we don't really call it the healthy side and the injured side in Achilles tendinopathy. We call it the least symptomatic and most symptomatic. So maybe both sides were not. So maybe they were even more affected in their function. Another study from 2008 from JUSPT actually looked at runner with a previous history of Achilles tendinopathy and with those compared to those that didn't. And they saw the changes in knee and tibia transfer plane mechanics. So no longer having symptoms several years after, you might have changes in your mechanics. So this has been up twice by Christian and um, Ben have had up in various, and this is actually from Ledbetter in 1992. It's a great article talking about the illustration of pain and dish damage. And what we're all trying to say is that the period of overloading and degenerative changes in the tendon occurs a lot before you actually feel the symptoms. And one of the relative problems then is for return to sports, as been illustrated earlier today too, is when we talk about the patient doesn't have symptoms, you send them back to sports, they come back to your clinic and they say, I got injured again, or your treatment didn't work. I would argue that the treatment worked very well, but you just went back to loading too heavy too early. So why do we think that, over, why does athletes overload the tendon? What's so important of the tendon? And I would argue always, and I teach my PT students that tendons, especially the Achilles tendon, is the most important body part. I do have other uh, colleagues that say it's the brain and the heart, but they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but the tendon's importance for athletic performance cannot be underestimated. The tendon saves you energy, the tendon improves your explosive performance. And in order to improve that extra half a centimeter in high jump or be able to do these things, you really need a healthy tendon. And sports today is becoming ultra competitive. I mean, it's differences of milliseconds to win or not to win, which means the tendon needs to be at its optimal performance. So when we're talking about the tendon injury that maybe we see in the clinic, it's really the pain that we see. They come in, they have pain and symptoms. Symptoms could be stiffness, it's uncomfortable. And um, the pain does a lot. And I think that's been alluded to by Nicola earlier too. And also if you look at the, ex if you induce experimental Achilles tendon pain, you see changes in motor response. So as soon as you have the pain, the muscle is not gonna function the way they would. Uh, there's also indications that you have nervous system sensitization in persistent tendinopathies. 
So when we're looking at beyond just the pain, because I said I thought there are other th things as performance that's important. What we're really working on too is in others, a lot of research is going on trying to look at the mechanical properties of the tendon. And how does the mechanical properties in the tendon affected by the tendinopathy? And how does that affect performance? So a lot of the studies are looking at the symptomatic subjects. You have patients coming in, they have pain. How does a tendon look? So what we know is the tendopath tendinopathic tendons have lower tendon stiffness and elastic modulus, meaning the patient comes in and complains of stiffness, but the tendon is actually less stiff. And I think that's the first thing. The stiffness that they're describing is not related to actually the mechanical properties of the tendon. The tendon is actually less stiff. And I compare it to and explain it to my patients is if your tendon is healthy, it's like having a basketball. I don't think we talked enough about basketball today, so I leave out the soccer or football. So the basketball with a lot of air in it, you drop it, it bounces very well. If you take some air out and try to bounce it, it's really hard to make it bounce as high. You have to work a lot harder. And that's a comparison to having a tendon that does not have its ultra best uh, mechanical properties. You can also see that changes in other viscoelastic properties. So when you look at tendons, I work a lot with biomedical engineers, and um, when you look at mechanical properties, you usually talk about elastic modulus, viscoelastic properties, and shear modulus. It's just three different ways of looking at mechanical properties. But there's also altered Achilles tendon viscoelastic properties that affect explosive performance in athletes. And there's also altered strain shortening cycle behavior during submaximal hopping. And I think Nicola was talking about the ballistic movement. And that to me is what we do um, uh, quick rebounding heel rises or hopping. This is what we're talking about. This will be affected as well. But all these patients have symptoms. You can also see tricep sura activation is altered in runners with Achilles tendinopathy. So the question is, well, maybe it's not the tendon mechanical properties. Maybe it's the pain that's causing these changes. And what's really interesting, it's more studies also looking at, if you look at mechanical properties, and I think Ben talked about the progression of tendon and that the end wasn't tendon rupture. I would argue that if you, if you don't take away the symptoms, that probably we have these tendinosis changes. Tendinopathy is painful, but tendinosis is the degenerative changes in the tendon. These degenerative changes in the tendon actually change the mechanical properties. And probably we talk more about the rupture in the next one, but maybe the ruptures have the same changes within the tendon, they just don't have symptoms. The tendinopathy patients have the changes and actually develop the symptoms. I usually argue maybe the pain is protective of a rupture. But besides that, then we try to look at asymptomatic subjects. And those are the ones that had previous tendinopathy, they have no more symptoms, they're back to their activity, don't have any concerns, but there might be, still be some tendinosis changes within the tendon. And if you look at those, it was one of the studies I mentioned first, in asymptomatic runners, they exhibit changes in knee kinetics during running, indicating permanent changes in knee biomechanics that, that might relate to the uh, Achilles changes. A very recent study from Chang and Kulig, now in 2015 in Journal of um, Physiology, they looked at Achilles tendinosis and they showed that the result in more compliant tendon, these were patients that previously had tendinopathy but no longer symptoms. And what they also saw that this compliant tendon elicits a series of neuromechanical adaptations. And I think Nicola kind of set this up very, very nicely. So what you see is you have changes in the mechanical properties. This changes how the muscle works. You have prolonged electromechanical delay. Then you might have an upregulation of the central nervous system that kind of changes how it works. So you see decreased agonist activity, decreased antagonist activity, and maybe an increase in synergistic activity. So if the calf muscle doesn't work very well, maybe they start using the tibialis posterior. You see the flexor halus is longus. It's very active in dancers. Flexor digitorum longus. So when I'm talking about return to play, and what Ben was talking about too, I think really we need to talk about this area way before. Because you gotta realize the tendon takes I say six months to a year. Most people would say all the studies do three months, and for that sense, we think 12 weeks and they should be better. I would argue that six months to a year is what it takes a tendon to um, recover from injury. Doesn't mean a patient has pain and symptoms for that time, but to actually have a recovery from the tendon. So six to 12 months is very hard to take an athlete out. Um, so if we can stop it earlier, if we can educate the athletes early, that they need to stop a lot earlier and maybe do the load uh, control. So 
So I would argue that the problem starts before what we consider the injury. It's a very insidious onset, so you need to listen to the early symptoms of, indi indi uh, of indications of the injury. And we really try to, um, the one person that had tendon injuries and been with me, one of my education is to really, you're going to have this again, because you're an elite athlete, you're going to have some tendon issues again. Next time you need to listen to the first signal and take a recovery period. Training errors contribute in 60 to 80 percent of those with Achilles tendinopathy. So we know that this overloading is what the problem is. There's also indication that greater mileage and running years in injured runners. So when we're talking about the um, athletes, I would say that athletes balance on the, I don't know what it is, everybody had elephants today, and I swear, I had this picture way before I saw the other elephants. <laughs> They're cute though. Uh, athletes balance on the edge of overuse to perform at an ultimate level. It is not if, it is when you're gonna have overload or problems from your Achilles tendon. And I think that's what we really need to focus on. And I think either we treat the minor symptoms, the stiffness, a little bit uncomfortable, uh, with low control, instead of ignoring or just treating the symptoms. But maybe we need to take an even further step because a lot of the elite athletes that I've talked to, and when you start with the treatment and you discuss, what you really see, a lot of them well, a lot of them are perpetual overloaders, right? I mean, that's in their nature. But also, what their response is, several of them have described, actually several months before they come with the injury, with the pain, they see some change in their performance. High jumpers, they don't jump quite as well, so they train more. The runner's time, it's not as good. Everybody else is doing great. My time is going down. I'm going to train more. So I think maybe this change in the performance level is what really we should look at early on because we might be able to detect these things. And a lot of times when the performance level goes down, we should make them give more recovery instead of training more. But we all know if you're not doing as well, we just keep on doing the same thing and we just keep on doing it more. And I think that's one of the problems that we're seeing. So back again, we talked about the full symptomatic recovery. So how do we know then tendon injury and performance? What do we do in the clinic? It sounds fine and dandy what you're talking about early on, but sometimes they come with injury. And this talk is not really addressing the rehab. It's all out there. I'm sure you guys know and seen the literature with the rehab. And it's also in the journal. Um, one of the things that we've worked on for many years is looking at the heel rise tests. We're looking at um, max tests for the second picture there. We're looking at power, actually, concentric and eccentric powers at various load, which are probably the rate of force developments. And now I have to go back after Nicholas talked to look at what actually was the rate of force development instead of the actual power number. Um, then we have drop jump tests. We have hopping, which is the rhythmical hopping. We have counter movement jumps that whoever was talking about yesterday all these things that we're looking at, and we're putting it into a test battery, and these are the tests that we saw that it was deficits even though we didn't have symptoms. In my research lab now at University of Delaware, um, we have a grant and we're really working um, together with biomedical engineer, working on mechanical properties, and we're using elastography, which is a way of vibrating the tendon, and then you see how the waves go through the tendon, and if you know how to vibrate it, the speed of the way will give you mechanical properties, so we will get the shear modulus or viscosity. And we're looking at this in patients with Achilles tendinopathy. And what's really interesting, if we're doing these mechanical properties, they correlate significantly with our heel rise tests. So the total amount of work you can do in a heel rise test correlate with your shear modulus, meaning if your mechanical properties go down, your heel rise work go down. And it might be that if you have more of an elastic tendon, your muscle has to work a lot harder, like bouncing that basketball, and that might be why it correlates. So if you can't do elastography in your clinic, you can always do the heel rise test. We're looking at the return to play for tendinopathy. So I think that irrespective of treatment path or injury, we, need, we end up with the same question. We talked a little bit before about the reactive tendinopathy, all these various things. But in the end, everybody with a tendon injury, I think we end up with the same question. The rupture might be a little different, but how do we most efficiently return the athlete to play? How quickly should they return? For how long should the athlete be able to participate? What is the performance state? What should the symptomatic state? And what is really considered then a success? So if you're looking at re-injury and recurrence rates, and I think that's been up a little earlier today too, but return to sports after 12 weeks of treatment been reported to be 10 to 86%, huge variations. And it's very different how people evaluate it. And again, the evidence, the better the evidence, 
the uh, less people return. Uh, return to sport of one year, anywhere from 55 to 99 percent. The problem is when you're looking at elite and professional athletes, a lot of these are recreational athletes that might not have the same requirement. The injury rates of Achilles tendinopathy in football players is 27 to 44 percent. Or are they in the re-injury rates? Are they all recurrence rates? The recurrence common and re-injury risk in elite football players with short recovery periods. And I'm using football because I'm in Europe, so I'm not going to say soccer to my American friends. Um, one of the studies that Ben brought up that we had done in 2007 was to look at the group that could continue running and jumping versus the group that couldn't. And actually the hardest part about this study was the group that was not allowed to run and jump to get them to actually continue in the group that they wasn't allowed to. So these people want to continue. So I think one of the benefit we had in this study in the future is if there was no negative effect found. This is the VISA score where 100 is fully recovered and you see the change over time. Uh, the score is also affected by your total activity level. But we see equal changes over time in both these groups. So the patients come to me instead of some other PT because, well, you tell me I can run. So having that compliance is very good to allow to do it. But I also think if we can allow them to continue with some activity, they might not degrade in their physical activity level as much so we don't have a, such big of a hole to get back out of. We also looked at hopping pain, just hopping, which you can do in the clinic too, and the rate the pain, hopping is standing on one leg like jumping rope. We do 25 jumps and the rate the pain, and we see this decreases over time. The interesting thing that Ben was saying, what are the other variables? And one of the things, you know, we did the study, I was part of my PhD, and I could have easily written a 20-page long paper, it will never get accepted, but one of the things that we really worked on, we used the pain monitoring model, that uh, Ben was talking about, they couldn't have too much pain. The interesting thing though is we also allowed for recovery days, and I'll get back to that, but I think really having extra recovery days from loading activity, and that's what we put in our model, it's the big key to getting a positive outcome instead of overloading and getting a negative outcome. I also have the business article from 2005 that did not see any effect, but they did perform at a very high level. So the thing is that we use is the pain monitoring model. It actually, Roland to me, who was my advisor, used it for patellofemoral pain, the head of that. He tried to call it the pain monitoring system. I know Ben said pain monitoring system, I think. The reason we try not to say that is because we don't want to call it PMS for short. <laughs> I always say weird things when I live in the US, but I'm not going to say that. Okay, pain monitoring model is basically using the pain level, and I think Christian was talking about it too. He had the stoplights if you're allowed to continue or not to continue. So we use this from zero to five. So up, pain level up to a five is okay. The interesting thing with tendon though is very rarely in athletes in the return to sport, it's not the pain that you're having when you're doing activity. It is how you feel the next day. Don't ever, ever let an athlete do more because they have no symptoms when they're doing it. You set the time, they're doing it, and you rate it the next day. Because a lot of times for tendons in the return phase, it's the stiffness, the discomfort that they feel the next day that's the problem. So we've been using this over time, but the people that was also, what we really did in this study was your pain level had to return back to where you were before you can do your next loading period. And what we're really working on is having two to three recovery days between heavy loading activity. That leads me to the, um, article that we wrote, and we've been working on this for 10, 15 years, and me and Kay Crossley wrote this together, is a proposed return to sport program for patients with mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. And really this is something that is relating to all these articles and studies that I've already done. We're trying to put it together with the understanding of the tendon healing, tendon recovery, loading of the tendon, and put it together in a program. And I think you've heard it yesterday, you've heard it today. It's sometimes we don't know exactly if our program is absolutely the best. But as long as you have a program, you're so much better at getting athletes going forward. You're so much better at getting the compliance. And I don't think you doubt yourself. Because one of the issues with tendon is a lot of times you treat them for three to six weeks, they're not going to get better. But if you're starting doubting yourself, then the patients start doubting you and they're not going to listen and you can't follow through. So these patients, when they come to me, I tell them, I can help you. It's nice when people can Google you because they already believe you know something. Who knows, right? Um, I'm sure they read the research articles. Uh, they listen to you, and the problem is, I can treat you, in six weeks, you're not gonna be better. 
but you need to do this if you're going to be better in the year. A year is going to pass. Most of them have pain for you know anywhere from you know six months to ten years on and off. Give me a year, and I can get you better in a year. If you're looking at them, they stay in this from the beginning when they have a lot of problem. It's really easy to get in the compliance. So what we're doing then is the factors that we consider is the tendon healing, the tendon recovery, the pain and symptoms, also the impairments, also the load of the Achilles tendon. And this is what's going to change then if you apply it to any other tendon. What is the load with the actual activity? And we also look at the proceed of the rate exertion from the athletes. So when we're looking at tendon healing, you need to consider what stage of tendon injury healing the athlete is in. Full of tendon heal takes up to 12 months. Mechanical loading is needed for tendon healing. And there are other factors that are related to the tendon. This is when uh, the top is a healthy Achilles tendon, the bottom is obviously an injured Achilles tendon, it's actually an Achilles tendon rupture. Uh, but adequate loading can make an injured tendon become a healthy tendon. Overloading or even underloading can make a healthy tendon become less healthy or less uh, strong to withstand the forces. So this is the balance. And then you ask, what's the adequate loading? Well, probably somewhere in there. But as long as you can kind of measure and evaluate and progress over time with the knowledge, at least you know when you reach too much, and then you can step back. When we're looking at the tendon recovery, and I think this is one of the key things from our previous article that wasn't as much discussed in it. But if you understand that Achilles tendon is loaded 6 to 12 times body weight with running, if recovery between training sessions are inadequate, we talked about this model, lead to further injury instead of recovery. And tendinopathy is a result of collagen degradation occurring to a greater degree than collagen synthesis. So some of the studies from uh, Michael Chair's group, Peter Magnuson, Henning Langberg in, in Denmark have done amazing work on this and all their citations. I didn't put them in there because I have so many in relation to this, but it's in, in the article is, but one of the things is that collagen synthesis and collagen degradation occurs right after a loading activity. And they take each other out, so you don't have a net plus. But after 37 to 78 hours, they actually saw a net synthesis after a bout of exercise. And that's kind of what I have used at my guideline to get a positive thing. So my clinical implication is plan for three recovery days between heavy Achilles tendon loading activities in order to not get the spiral down. Every time my patients stop doing, they feel great, they ignore me, they come back three weeks later. I have symptoms again, oh yeah, did you run every day? And they're like, yeah. Don't do it, you need to follow the program. So when you're looking at the pain and symptoms, it's okay to have pain during the rehabilitation. But during the return to play stage, the pain might be absent, so you really need to look at the next day and then assess where they're at. When we look for progression of tendon load, there's some interesting things really looking at it, but we all say return to play is a gradual progression in load. Load on a tendon can then be increased either by increasing the load, but also increasing the speed of movement actually increases load on the tendon. So walking loads the Achilles tendon three and a half times body weight. Achilles tendon uh, with running is six to 12 times body weight, depends on the speed. So increased speed of the running increases the load. Other data that come out, very interesting data from 2013, if you look at the foot strike pattern, because everybody was going to go from heel striker to midfoot to forefoot, that's what we all wanted to be. I think that phase is over a little bit, but that's what everybody's talking about. Um, it was great for my business. Everybody went to forefoot striker to avoid shin splints and stress fractures. They all got Achilles tendinopathy. So rear foot strike pattern loads the Achilles tendon less than forefoot or midfoot. And they actually calculate, if you use a four-foot and mid-foot strike pattern, it add an additional load of 48 times body weight for each 1.6 kilometer. The reason it's 1.6 kilometer is because they use one mile. Just think of that. So we can easily control these things. The Alter G is a perfect way to control the load if you want to do that, if you want to do running. Using shorter step length could be beneficial. Stiffer running surfaces was related to decreased injury risk. So how do we individualize the load? And I think this is what we really worked on with elite athletes. So if I'm going to tell you you can only do a heavy loading activity with three days of recovery, what is heavy load for me? It's probably running three miles. Oh, man, it's snowing outside. Oh, sorry. I think it is. That's so cool. Sorry. I'm short on time, too. I like Christmas. OK. Totally off topic. The, if you're looking at the athletes, 
perceived exertion, but we have to pull ourselves together. So one other thing is that the high jumpers, the elite high jumpers and people that I work with, I have to work with the coaches and we have to determine what is heavy load for this athlete. It's not my loading. For the high jumpers is usually very heavy plyometric loading. The problem what the coaches were doing, they're doing plyometric loading but they don't want to overload them, so they do a little plyometric every day. And I think if you do it every day, you never really have a good recovery. So we have set up this model that used the pain monitoring model uh, and it's all in the article, the pain level after the activity, we look at the patient's perceived exertion with that Achilles tendon activity. So how heavy do you feel running 10 miles is on your Achilles tendon? How heavy do you think these plyometric exercises are for your tendon? So they rate that, and then we decide how many recovery days. And then we can decide what is a light activity, they can do that every day, what is a medium activity, and what is a high activity. And then we can set up a model that they don't have to have three days recovery from any, everything, but we kind of adjust the model. So for a runner, this is my, what it would be looking like. So maybe they walk every day. This is a more of a recreational runner, jogging for 20 minutes, do the rehab, running at a higher level, 85% for 20 minutes. So then you can guide what's a high and low activity. And then every day they document how are the symptoms when they were doing it, how are the symptoms the next day, and then you readjust. I like that I finally had to put this up in nicely writing. Usually my patients leave with handwritten things. So I just want to share this with you, is that I had a 62-year-old runner, maybe not our professional athletes, but he is adamant about running. We know physical activity is very important for everything regarding to health, our mental health and our physical health. He sent me an email two years after the initiation of the program. He came to me at a pain for many, many years, and I said, you follow my program, I know you're going to get there and then I was holding my fingers crossed in the back. Um, at the start of the program, he was unable to run, but he followed this diligently. I don't treat him every day. He sends email, I see him every three months, and I just got this email. It's been a very good summer, the best pain-free injury sum free summer in 10 years. I did nine races this summer, eight sprint triathlons, and one Olympic. Generally faster races than last year. Yesterday I ran over 10 miles with zero issues. One of the sprints, I missed the transition area and ran barefoot for 5K in just over eight minute miles. Most of my races are, and then he gives the time. This is significantly faster. Well, talking about low progression, I'm probably gonna see him in a few months. But anyway, for in, after two years starting not running, really following, and he was so irritated at six months. Like, can I do more? No, we have to follow it. But I think you can really, it's easy for me after seeing a lot of people coming through this to really stick to it. So. Principles of the return to sport program. Progressively increase the demand on the tendon by controlling intensity, duration of Achilles tendon loading. Continue with the rehabilitation exercises, the tendon loading during the return to sports phase. I actually think everybody should do heel rises all the time. I think there's a forgotten muscle and forgotten tendon, but that's another story. Education. Easiest to educate about this phase when the athlete has a lot of symptoms. Don't educate about this when they feel good. They're not going to listen. Training diaries. I have training diaries for years from patients. They fill in every day. They have a pay. A lot of them have now done um, Excel spreadsheets. So they send me their Excel spreadsheets, what I have every month, and I can see exactly what they do. If they fill out training diaries and bring them to them, you have to look at them. It's like the kids doing homework and they were not tested on it. We won't do it. Initiate program early when athlete can perform activities of daily living with pain no higher than two out of 10. So take home message. Full recovery of tendon function important for performance does not re directly relate to symptoms. Treat minor symptoms of tendonopathy early with load control. Consider changes in sports performance as possible sign of tendon overuse. And use the return to play program as a model to individualize each patient. And I just want to give some acknowledgement to all my other researchers, both in Sweden and in the uh, United States. And thank you.